On the morning in which we were captured, April 5th, um, it was one of those mornings where we decided we were going to go out and spend a night with the rebels. Now, this wasn't necessarily a, a, a dangerous or suicidal proposition. It was sort of the idea that you were going to encamp with them and get some flavor you know, over a period of 24 hours, something that, you know, of course, I had done in Afghanistan with U.S. troops in a much more organized fashion. Um, so it was the idea we were going to do this, and it was myself, um, Claire Gillis, uh, American journalist, Manu Bravo, uh, Spanish photojournalist, and Anton Hamill, a South African photojournalist who I had just met five days before. So we had this plan. We were going to get out there early. We were going to go and, and try to uh, beat the rush. Um, there had started to be a glut of reporters, in the, and lo and behold, the rebels were starting to get organized and trying to hold back reporters. So we wanted to beat that. We wanted to get a fresh look at the front lines. Um, and we also wanted to confirm because the truth is, you know, the, the first thing you lose in war is the truth, right? They say that. And, um, you know, the, the rebels were saying, we have the city of Brega. Of course, we didn't believe it because there was shelling going back and forth um, in the previous days. And so we said, we're going to confirm what's going on out there in the morning. So we went out there early and went past the last checkpoint, um, got a ride with a, a rebel uh, van past um, some trucks that were still smoldering. And I remember, you know, Anton turning to me or Manu and saying, hey, this isn't safe. And, and myself nodding, agreeing, because, you know, the fresh evidence of the battle was apparent. Um, but yet we didn't turn around. I remember um, having a chance to go back, loop back around to the last checkpoint, but we didn't turn around. And um, lastly, we got to the point where we saw another group of rebels in a civilian car and, and getting out and, and saying, you know, talking to them. Um, and, and one of them saying, Qaddafi forces are 300 meters away. And myself looking at Claire, like, that's impossible. Um, 300 meters was essentially just up the, up the top of this hill in front of us. And we said, well, let's get off the road anyways. Um, well, that was the exact wrong thing to do. Uh, about two minutes later, um, the rebel convoy, three, three cars, went up the hill and were immediately stopped by two uh, Gaddafi trucks filled with about five guys in each firing their AK-47s. Um, I remember so clearly, you know, as one reconstructs this moment in your life, um, hundreds of times. I remember them firing, and I remember the rebel trucks leaving without firing a shot, and immediately pressing myself to the ground, as close to the ground as I ever could, as you know, this machine gun fire was directed at us. Now, I've been in Afghanistan before, and I've been in Iraq, and you know, we toss around the term getting shot at. Well, this was truly getting shot at, and this was having, you know, maybe eight to 10 guns directed at you and, my, and myself and Claire and Mono and Anton. And the, the sound of it, the volume of it, the, you know, the sound of something eating metal in your ear must have been combined with the terror. And one loses track of time. All the body knows is to crawl, to press yourself to the ground. The instinct of survival is all that's left in, in what we must call adrenaline. Um, I remember crawling back to Claire and Mono and, and, and somehow in the back of my mind hoping against hope that there would be some kind of out out of this. There was some kind of trap door in time that perhaps um, the rebels were firing on us by mistake or perhaps the rebels were coming and were going to engage in a crossfire. Perhaps we would get help. Uh, none of these things happened. I crawled back to the sand dune um, in front of me. Anton was at the other sand dune in front of me, and I heard him call for help. And that call for help was the reality. He was severely wounded, I knew, f just from his voice. I called back to him over gunfire that was stre now streaming over our heads. 
he, he said, I said, Anton, are you okay? He said, no, more weakly. After the next stream of bullets, I called again, Anton, are you okay? There was no reply. So I felt this switch in my mind and I knew I had to surrender before you know someone else was killed or myself was killed. I surrendered, I, I called out um, you know, journalists in Arabic and was met by a group of young soldiers um, sort of spread out across the sand um, who approached me and uh, struck me and with you know with the butt of their AK-47, um, you know half dozen times, punched me. I didn't feel hardly anything. Such was my shock at seeing my colleague Anton um, morally wounded in the sand, knowing on on a level right away that he was dead. Um, we were we were thrown in the back of a truck. I remember a soldier looking over me and saying in English very clearly, "You go on patrol. You go on patrol." as if jeering and knowing exactly what we were trying to do. We were journalists trying to go on a patrol. Uh, I remember getting photographed with a cell phone. Um, my bloodied head from the blows, uh, getting photographed up close and thinking, you know, this is where they find all these photographs that are evidence of war crimes someday and, and realizing this is me now. And you know Claire being thrown in the back of the truck as well, and looking at me and saying, "Are you okay?" and and uh, being able to nod. Uh, that was the beginning of our ordeal. Um, and from then, nothing was was normal again. Um, we were there for 44 days in hands of the Qaddafi loyalists. Um, uh, that day, I was transported with zip ties to uh, Qaddafi's hometown of Sirte. Um, you know, three hours in the back of a, a vehicle um, next to Claren Mono, also zip tied and uh, feeling a, a loss of circulation and pain um, over those hours. You know, thank you. Well, now I think the occupiers have a point when they're zip tied, but at the time I, I thought, uh, when, is, when is this going to end? You know, being blindfolded, hearing um, music, some Qaddafi speech over and over again to the soundtrack of. 300, the movie. Um, eerie, weird, uh, scary. Um, being uh, interrogated the first time, and at the end of that interrogation, being told, we think you're a spy. Uh, the next night, being asked to do state TV interview, and looking at Claire and Mono and saying, well, can we have another cigarette first? And then saying, well, that's probably a good idea. Uh, I don't think they used that state TV interview because we're a little too beat up. But seeing each other, seeing that we were OK, knowing that we had just committed the biggest mistake of our lives on, on the same level, and not being able to quite come to grips with what was going to happen to us, but knowing that New York Times story of those four journalists who had been captured became like a movie that I examined over my head during those first hours and days and realizing, you know, this is what's going to happen to us. The problem was we were captured at a time when it was much more difficult possibly to be captured because NATO had already struck hard and was supporting actively the rebels. As you know, um, they defended the city of Benghazi on the 19th and stopped the Qaddafi invasion. I was there, I saw it. Now NATO was, was actively bombing Qaddafi positions and freeing up some cities. So we were seen as possibly the hand of NATO. We were seen as certainly a good bargaining chip to be used. They had released some journalists possibly too early and there was some speculation that uh, they didn't get anything for those journalists, so to speak. Well, they were gonna get something for us was what we thought and came to think. Um, over, over a period of days, we were, we were uh, shuttled from prisons to uh, other courts, which became kangaroo courts, where they would tell us, uh, you're, you're going to be um, released. But first, you have to go to this other prison, becoming part of another prison, and uh, quickly finding out this isn't a prison, but basically a holding camp for other revolutionaries, and you know being in a stuffed cell with eight other Libyan prisoners 
and actually feel uncomfortable and actually feeling uh, these, these guys understand that I'm a journalist and I'm trying to get the truth and perhaps wrongly they think I'm on their side, but I certainly feel like it now. Um, being able to, at the end of 18 days, call my mother and actually tell her that I was okay and, and her being able to tell me that um, friends and family were, were doing everything they could and uh, eventually being, being freed and, and, and meeting my brother in, in Tunisia um, and seeing him for the first time and, and hearing the stories of what people had done. Um, and I had a lot of time when I, when I got back to the States, I had a month to play over those moments, especially that one day when we were captured, what I would have done, what I could have done, what I should have done, and, and really examining those things and, and talk, being able to talk about it openly. And, and I think uh, the pain of going through that and the pain of also talking through it was, was, was the thing that really made the difference in my being able to go back to Libya um, August 25th went back to Libya and wanted to jump back into um, the fall of Tripoli. Tripoli fell to rebel hands and to, to NATO hands. And what, what actually happened was uh, Qaddafi forces retreated. Um, ma many of his forces laid down their guns and probably assimilated back into the population. And uh, as we now know, many of them moved to Sirte, um, which became his hometown, became a, a walled city, a defended city. So. Um, we went to CERT on this, on this second trip to Libya, and eventually Mono and Claire came too, and, and we spent days and days in CERT covering this battle. Strangely enough, we were back into the battle, the three of us. We were back covering the war again. It was dangerous again. And there was that moment in time where you felt like you were doing the exact same thing again and you could be killed again. But there was also other moments when I felt like I didn't take that extra step. I stepped back.